Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ann Time Goble, who is our speaker today, and she's going to tell us all about her latest book, and I think it's very relevant to the Linguistics Career Launch, which has a theme, uh, run, one of our running themes is about voice user interfaces. So Anne, take it away. You're not going to ask me questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can ask you questions. Well, first, tell us about your background. I mean, sure. I think that's helpful if people know how you got to the place where you could write. That's them. great. Yeah, totally. Um, so I actually, so I grew up in Sweden um, and I um, came over here first uh, for a year abroad in college. And, you know, that's what happens. I'm still here a really long year. And... Um, <laughs> But a and, great year, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and actually, the first time I heard, so sort of first quick forward, um, I stayed, obviously. I ended up getting a PhD in linguistics and cognitive science from UCSD, <laughs> Nancy's alma mater. Um, and, and Robbins um, from the and last Robbins. session. Yep. Cool. And, um, but the first time I heard about linguistics, I remember because we had actually an exchange student from L.A., when I was in high school, she came and stayed with us. And she was basically a year ahead of me and she just started college and she said she was going to major in linguistics. And what is this thing? <laughs> you know, why have I not heard of this? I love languages, you know. And um, so then when I went to my year abroad and stuck around, I basically ended up doing linguistics, right? Um, and I, actually the great thing about that in college, I went to Washington State and they didn't have a linguistics department, but they had people you know, spread around in different departments who were associated to make this program. So it was you know, sort of uh, languages, computer science, philosophy, psychology, you know, you know the, the expect, what you would expect as a combination of, of programs. And I think that was really great because to me, I, I like that sort of broad background because of course it touches so many things. I mean, everything feeds into each other. I don't like the siloing. You know? And, um, and so then UCSD was really great because of the Cogside department. Um, and there was a lot of interdisciplinary connections and you know, so on. And while I was in grad school, I started working um, just part-time, um, first doing phonetic marking for um, the King database, it was ITT, PCD. Um, and uh, so very low level phonetic marking because I was really fond of, of, of phonetics. I mean, I just I took to that right away, right? And um, then eventually I got another job that then turned into what I did after I finished grad school. So I thought, do I want to do the academic thing or do I want to continue this way where they're going to, you know, contain, they'll take care of everything, including visas at the time, right? So um, I started working for this little uh, startup, which was a language related uh, uh, sort of small R&D company and I worked for them for a while and then eventually ended up at Nuance and was at Nuance for many years like many other people at the time um, that was kind of you know the place that many of us met and they're still in touch right from there and it's funny because I remember at one point while I was there my roommate and my, my office mate at the time and I were talking about you know this is probably the only job that we can have that uses linguistics in industry, right? I mean, what did we know? Back then it felt like that. I was like, oh, lucky us, we ended up doing this kind of thing. And now of course it's, you know, wow, lucky us to pick such a direction of doing something that we actually find really interesting uh, being linguistics and related things and ending up being able to do a lot of it with, with it, whether we want to stay in academia or go on some, some other things. And then I went through a couple other you know, places. I was at Amazon for a bit, like pre-early Alexa, pre-release for Alexa, Alexa. And um, um, some startups, you know, it, it's an interesting thing to be at small companies and big companies and compare, you know, the pros and cons, of course, of both. And uh, now I'm at a start, little startup again. And um, then I, I, call that, I call that my yo-yo career. I yeah, yeah, exactly. Big, That's pretty much company, it. Small company, big exactly. company, small company. Exactly. Big companies and small companies that become bigger companies. Exactly. So I tend to like the smaller companies, but, but there are pros and cons. But yeah, so here I am. The book, the book that we're talking about today is um, not your first book and not even your first book in this domain, right? No, it's my first book. Oh, oh, okay. Other than transcribing um, and 
sort of self-publishing a thing about my my dad's history during the 50s and oh, everything oh. like that <laughs> but that doesn't okay. count <laughs> okay good I All just right. have so, a look of an experienced author I guess <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. the multi-volume author I've, yes, I've right. I like writing <laughs> <laughs> good so tell us about uh about the book that you've written called yeah. Mastering User. yeah so the you know I mentioned earlier not liking silos right and realizing especially during the nuance years realizing how important it is to kind of have your fingers in everything in a way um so we were lucky at the start of that time in that everybody kind of talked to each other and it was kind of we figured things out as we were going right so we had access to oh there's chris stewart joining <laughs> um we have access to things that most people don't have access to now, but we did not have access to things that are common now, right? So, I mean, now it's super easy for people who are not in a company or academic setting, right, to have access to voice technology. And it was really hard back then in the sort of early 2000s, right? That was a very limited set of people who could do it. But because we actually were in it, you know, we could access data, we could make changes to all kinds of parameters or have people change it for us and you know, actually see the result of it. So there are all these things that we learned then that we kind of miss now, I guess, in a way, because like, oh, if only we could actually do these things, then experiences could be so much better. But for various reasons, it's harder to do sometimes, right? And um, so uh, Charles, who's my co-author, who's an MIT engineer uh, who was at Nuance and we were at one of the startups together too. We said, you know, we have all these experiences that we'd like to share, but what we really want to share also is the importance of kind of not thinking in silos, right? But to really see how do you, you know, there are books and writing for the designers, there's books and writing for the developers, but what about that interface, right? So we really try to do things kind of in each chapter. It's we try really hard to sort of web those things together. Mm. And you know, things for program managers, product managers, whoever, right? You don't have to be, definitely don't have to be a hardcore coder to read this stuff, right? You just skip over the code if you want <laughs> or look at it. But I mean it it all ties together. So it's a lot of, you know, here's why you should do this, you know, a lot of in-depth of do this because if you don't, then this happens. Or here's some experience we had, possibly kind of hidden a little bit to not call out the guilty parties or <laughs> including ourselves. Right? <laughs> but you know, think here's an experience and here's why that happened and things like that. So, so you structured this for, I mean, you, you wrote this book with mm -hmm. the intention that it was not only linguists mm -hmm. who are going to look at it. That's right. And not only um, developers in the voice space but a much broader audience. So yeah. was, that, was it hard to think that way? I mean, was it hard to write that way? Or no, that not really. I, I think that part was easy in a way. I mean, I, what I tended to do was I did most of the sort of prose writing, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and Charles wrote about how it fit in. I mean, I was kind of I would go first, you know, it's sort of like, does the music or the lyrics come first? You know, <laughs> different people do it different ways. Right. But I would sort of do it first and say, here, put something in here that shows this. And then Charles would come in and do that. And then we'd sort of make sure that it fit together. Okay. Um, so, and that's, that worked pretty well. I mean, there was this, you know, pandemic thing, of course, that sort of oh, that. <laughs> spread out the time a little bit. But, um, but in general, I think that, that worked pretty well. But, you know, it really, it depends on your, you know, if you're going to have a co-author, it depends on how you work together and right. who does right. what. Right, right. So then the, the related question is, I, I have a, a slight awareness that you switched publishers in midstream. Is that true? Yeah, pandemic. Pandemic? Is that what happened? Okay. Yeah, basically. Okay, we can blame COVID. Why not? Yeah, totally. Um, and... Well, I'm, I'm happy to open this to other people, but if you have some, I, I'd love to hear a little piece of this uh, as a little example, you know, if you've come up with one yet. Well, 
I, I will get you a better example because this is actually not one sort of from our work experience per se, but um, but it's one actually just from home life. And I don't want to call out, you know, we don't, if we have any, if we worked in the field or if we even, you know, listen to um, you know, virtual assistants or anything, I know how, I mean, it's hard, right? So one of the reasons that we kind of hid some of the examples, so I don't want to call anybody out, right? Because it's just difficult. But I just want to share this example that happened in our house a while back, which is, okay. um, you know, a, a home assistant who allows you to do shopping on it, shall we say. Um, but we don't do that. We don't have it set up. And I, um, actually, my husband left, walked out of the kitchen and said, you know, turn off the under cabinet light or something like that, which is kind of the main thing we use it for, turn off the light, right? And it said something like, okay, I put blah, 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 kitchen pulls in your shopping cart. And I'm like, whoa, what? <laughs> and I, I has this example in the book, of course, but um, it's such a great example because it just shows this kind of catastrophic fail when things aren't quite lining up. For example, this was a very poor audio capture. It probably should have just been rejected, but instead it tried to make sense of it. And it just kind of went down a path that was a very odd one, right? So it was sort of, whoa, that shouldn't happen. It's a useful example because it helps us understand sort of the level at which you are calling things out and that you're drawing people's attention to uh, what counts as a failure. Yeah, and you know, this is an example of where it is a lot harder in some ways today because you know, a designer may or may not see this and say, hey, you know, we have to be sure that this doesn't happen. And things are so, again, siloed and so separated that things like this fall in the cracks. Right? Mm. And because it's just kind of harder to, to go in and fix them and not break something else in the process and things like that, right? And um, yeah. So you're mostly then in this book talking about speech to something is mm -hmm. that true um not only you mean as opposed to text-to-speech synthesis yeah or, or some of the other ways that we interpret voice user interfaces these days that's mainly yeah i mean either one of the points is that it doesn't really matter so much if you're doing something for a, a home assistant or a sort of call center ivr kind of thing or in car or whatever it is right on some level, I mean, details, of course, right? But still it's users that should be able to talk like users and shouldn't have to be taught to say certain things, but, and how to make sure that this catastrophic failure doesn't happen, right? And things like that. And also we talk about, you know, the importance of privacy and trust and, and you know, good audio output, you know, whether it's synthesis or, a recorded voice talent and things like that, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Uh, and I, I noticed in the chat, Mim is saying, Alexa doesn't like my accent. Uh -huh. She always says, mm, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> right. So I did, um, that's a great comment, right? Yeah. And, and of course, the thing that most people have issues with, with all speech stuff is sort of, Oh, I'm not understood. And whatever the reason is, the feeling of it's the way I talk in terms of accent or how I express myself in terms of the words and so on, right? And of course, it, it's, it's a hard task. And of course, it has to be better, right? For, for all, all, all um, I'm not picking on Alexa at all, right? But all the integrations that it, it's, there's a lot of that low hanging fruit that have not been picked and eaten. <laughs> and the hard stuff is still there, right? It's it's a favorite thing of my say when people say, oh, well, you know, there's music, asking for music, that's simple, that's done, right? Not at all, right? Because if you want to find out how it breaks, you just have to ask for specific things and see how easy it is to break something like that. And, and that's something that I also worked on for a few years for another company was, you know, understanding music requests, right? Which is very tricky, actually. So what's the tricky part for that? Well, so, my, so um, for example, there's, um, so the 
the band uh, Massive Attack has a song named um, Rising Sun. Okay. But it's spelled in a kind of unusual way. So there are many ways that this can go wrong. And depending on, you know, how does it interpret? Because, of course, there's this interpretation, right? You say something, it will be interpreted as text. Then does the text actually match the search in the database of music? Mm -hmm. And then is the music there? Is there some kind of ownership issue? Or does one company try to push something and not something else? Is it a song or an album? You know, there are all these different places where it can go wrong. And how do you deal with that? Because you don't want to ask people, did you mean this one? Do you want the song? Do you want the album? What do you want? Because it's just like, how do you decide if you should just give people something and they say, no, that's wrong and try again. Right? Yeah. So how, just, how far do you back up? Yeah, What's exactly. wrong about it? Okay. Yeah, exactly. I can right. fix it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh. Right. And yeah. it's like, does it matter? It's just a song. Oh, you meant to buy the song. Well, then you probably want to make sure that it's the right thing, right? <laughs> you just want to hear it. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, you didn't want to hear the cover version. Oh, okay. <laughs> you didn't want to hear the disco version. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Right, 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 right. Other people right. have questions or, or comments. Has anybody in the audience had a chance to pick up Anne's book yet? And Anne, are you <laughs> going to show it? Do you, can you show us the cover so we can? Oh, because I'm like trying to find a good example in there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Excellent. <laughs> ah, there it is. Excellent. OK. All right. So Adriana, Adriana, do you want to, um, I'm not saying your name right. But anyway, do you want to come off mute and ask your question directly? I can try. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm not really familiar with what happens with voice interfaces. And I'm curious about what, what is really going on. Um, do you need to be a phonetician or a phonologist to work on mm. it? And what are the main aspects that need to be worked on for voice interfaces? Like the groups of people in a company, like how do you divide the work um, in like, Okay, so I will focus maybe on the words that can be recognized or like the sounds. How does it work? That's a great question. And, you know, that probably also depends on where you are, what company and so on. And if you're in one of the larger companies, you're probably going to be more specialized than if you're at a smaller company. But, um, uh, you know, so I would say there's such, well, one way to answer it is there's such a demand for call it whatever conversation designer buoy designer whoever um speech scientist there's such a demand that and there isn't no real official training until very recently right even for any kind of stuff like this that um it, i would say there there's not necessarily going to be oh well you're a phonetician so you know you have to do this thing right it's, not at all um if you have an interest in the stuff and what i always say to people when i talk about mm, questions about doing this kind of work is the very best way i think to practice doing anything in this field is to really just like listen to interact with speech technology and do it like a study right like write record the thing transcribe it see what went wrong what went right figure out you know how it can be done better this also would be something that if you interview someplace you can then show oh i did this thing and that's always interesting to people um it um in the nuanced days i would say for on the design side people had all kinds of background it was linguistics psychology um you know computer science engineering there was just a general interest in in uh, language right and um these days, I'd say if you're doing the buoy design, unless you're like a super technical person right now, like, you know, really NLP, anything, coder person, the, the, the super coder technical focused people tend to these days be more the sort of speech science, like we're going to figure out how to make the actual recognition work better. Um, whereas the design side tends to be more, you know, the linguists, um, you know, whoever, um, psychologist, whatever, um, UX. In terms of how it's broken up, 
the sort of standard way of doing this kind of work will be first there's kind of a concept okay we're this is the area we're going to create something for and so you'd start out with how big an area might you define what's um well say maybe is this a you know a music finding app is it uh banking is it general knowledge you know that sort of thing and you know if it's it's easier of course if it's a little bit more specific like kind of cut down a little bit so that if you do general knowledge like alexa or or google right it's it's a whole different thing so we're going to put that aside a little bit but if it's a little bit more defined you're going to first start by saying well what are the kinds of things you sort of start with requirements right what does it do how do people do it today this is all kind of stuff that any kind of like UX or similar background you might have, it's perfect for that, right? So you just go and observe kind of who does what, how does it done now if it's done or what's missing today. Um, and, um, and, and then you start basically laying out the flow of what's gonna happen in here. What are some dialogue, example dialogues we talk about, right? That um, here's the sort of image of the wireframe of what the conversation should be like, the sort of best case. And here's some sample things of when, go, when stuff goes wrong, what should happen? And then you kind of dig into details more and more. And this is all kind of what, you know, this is perfect stuff for a linguist, right? Because we think about language things and how people communicate and so on. And um, um, then at some point, and of course you want to actually be, in, be working with the technical folks at the same time because you don't want to propose something that is going to be not, not possible to yeah, exactly right. not feasible within you know a reasonable amount of time or with the current technology because it's better to have something that actually works and something that's kind of mediocre right um, and uh, then you um, you'll specify very clearly like, these are exactly the kinds of things that people say and it's very important right to if there's things like the key words, you know, buy. Buy isn't bad, on right? People say buy, or did, is it, if it's a stock app, you don't want to say something buy and suddenly you've bought some stock, right? Because, you know, yeah, sure, it looks different on text, but not when you say it, right? Um, and um, so you basically want to lay out exactly the, the, um, the flow, the dialogues, and so on, dig into those details, and then... Um, you know, it's implemented and so on. Now, if you're in some place where you actually have access to what the users do and say and get the data from that, that's the really, this is also a place where linguists are great, right? And I, linguists really love doing this work, right? The sort of speech science work where you sort of decide, oh, look, those people weren't recognized. Those people weren't recognized because they said this thing and that's not handled right. So we have to then feed back into the recognition and say, oh, you know, look, we didn't take into account that people might phrase it this way or use these words that can also mean this other thing sometimes. And you sort of just dig into it. It's kind of like field methods or, you know, it's really fun. Um, and uh, <laughs> you can say, like, I really like that word. Um, in some places, you know, it's all very statistical based and there's still also ways to make voice applications or systems that, are very rule-based. So you can kind of specify that these are things that people will say. Um, this is, especially if you're doing things like, um, you know, health related stuff or financial stuff where you really have to make sure you know what people said because if it was wrong, that bad things happen. So sometimes having rule-based stuff where you're matching to specific things that people ask, like names of drugs or something, um, it's really important to have that. And, and I think it's, that's another thing that as a linguist is really fun, right? Because it's really kind of looking at exactly how do people phrase things. And so I'm kind of babbling a bit and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you so much. Okay, really sure. informative. Yes. <laughs> right. right, sometimes you're so far in it, you forget, you know, yeah, it's like right. not to be in it, right? Yeah, exactly. Other people have questions for Anne? So I'm going to I'm going to ask how did you organize the book? I mean, what's what's your sense of the flow through the understanding? Yeah, sure. The sort of overall is kind of start to finish of a project actually, you know, goes into a little bit the layout of how I uh, responded to the other question that 
sort of starting from how what happens first in a project like the overall organization is kind of start to finish of things that come up but there's like sec sections right so starting with how do you gather information and actually this is kind of a, a good example i think um Tanya's going to think of an example eventually um which is <laughs> um this uh, small startup that charles and i were at uh, was a healthcare related thing and um we somebody actually wanted us to do a voice recognition thing for urine sample collection at the hospital because okay. you don't it seems like it's a good idea right to have you don't have to touch anything because your hands are busy doing other things and you don't want but what the problem that they were trying to solve was that um, they had a lot of samples that got um, contaminated didn't, thank you contaminated and so they said, well, speech would be a good way to do it. It's like, that sounds kind of a cool idea, right? So we started kind of looking at that and we like laid out this flow and everything. And then I said, well, do you have any pictures of what the, the restrooms look like? Okay, and well, then we started looking at that. And then we realized, actually, what you really need is a table, right? And because there was no place for people to put anything, and probably that's why things got contaminated because they had to, you know, touch all kinds of furniture and whatever. Um, and the reason I mentioned this is because I really want people also to think about, you know, that whole thing to the man with the hammer, you know, everything looks like a nail because there are many places where voice is not the right thing, right? So pushing people into having a voice solution also isn't a good idea because they'll just be unhappy, right? Um, no, I love this example. This is a fabulous example because it really talks to the UX side of it. Mm -hmm, exactly. And Paul, Paulina, I'll be there in just one minute. Um, the, that is to say, some, the client asked for something. They thought mm -hmm. voice was the solution. You went in and did your uh, expectation about the flow of the process. Mm -hmm. You're going to yeah. receive a two little whatever. Oh, yeah, cups. we worked it all whatever. out. <laughs> yeah, and unwrap the cup so that you can put the urine in there and la, la, la. You know, so that you knew yeah. what the steps were that people exactly. were going to take and not get in trouble. And then you looked at the situation of use and realized, oh, my God, there's no table. <laughs> exactly, you know? exactly. And, and so you get to give the feedback mm -hmm. that voice may be an excellent add-on to this, but a more pragmatic and immediate solution. Let's see if we can avoid contamination by putting a physical table in the room, in the bathroom with them. Exactly. Yeah, so this is great. I mean, this is definitely a UX example as well as a voice mm -hmm. example. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, Paulina, yes, please. Yes, hi. hi. Uh, I have a question about when, when somebody's writing, we normally tend to mind uh, like an ideal reader so I was wondering who would be like this ideal reader for you? And uh, as a second question, let's say I might not fit your ideal reader. I might just be an average person, but I have interest in, in your mm -hmm. work. Uh, what would be your suggestion if I still, uh, I don't, there's still things that I don't really understand or like your book doesn't really cover, like what, are, what kind of suggestion tools, extra tools you will recommend? Well, even now, you know, there's a pretty limited set of books, right? Even, I mean, there are, there are a few and they're the good ones, right? But it's still right. pretty limited. So each one has kind of its own little focus and so on. And I would say for us, it was, so one thing that um, we, I was doing one many years ago at, at Nuance was we created this um, class for project managers um, to basically teach them about the nuanced technology and you know how to the sort of pitfalls of of uh, a speech project and so it's almost like some of that was still kind of in the back of my mind so that it could be something here that anybody who just wants to dig into why is it like this not just kind of the two-liner of oh here or like here are the five tips of doing a speech thing right but it was like okay that's great and why are you telling me that? So I would say that the ideal reader is somebody who really wants to look into what's underneath, what, what's the reasoning for this without having, you know, it's not like, like I said before, it's not a technical book in that it's, you have to have a particular degree in any particular kind of 
technical field. Instead, you can kind of picture, like, okay, here's talking about error handling or something. And here's some examples and why I said, and one thing that we have throughout is um, a lot of little sort of from, from the voice trenches examples and then also like, examples of, you know, doing it this way might lead to, excuse me, it might lead to this and this other way might be the other way. So on purpose, it could be, you're just interested in finding out more about why things go wrong or how to make them work better. Or you really want to look into some details about um, you know, how design stuff is done or how to code up something you know, that, would, that would run, that would work. And um, so basically it's a little bit for everybody and, and not necessarily something that I would expect people to just sit and read cover to cover, but just look up. You know, why is, is it, it that they ask me these questions? You know? Use it as a reference guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. So uh, did I answer that question? And the, the other, yeah, I mean, I have- That was affirmative even with your <laughs> okay. voice off. And in terms of the other books, I mean, you know, like I have a stack of, of uh, books that I tend to recommend to people. I, I don't want to leave Kathy anybody Glass, out. for example. And, you know, and I mean, some of the books that, um, don't usually come up necessarily because they're not, you know, speech per se. But I'm gonna just grab it because it's sitting right here. Good. I really like um, Jeff Johnson's stuff. I like this book. I <laughs> also Jeff Johnson's I, a really great guy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I recommended this one yesterday. So great. Oh, cool. Glad you recommended. And it's it like too. super easy to read. Yeah, I'm gonna get a book off my shelf so I can show it to you. Yeah, I do that. Uh, this is another <laughs> one that I like. I think like oh, a yeah. UX researcher. Who, who is this? I forgot. Who, who wrote this? Oh, uh, David Travis. Okay. Cool. Oops, it keeps like. <laughs> but it, yeah. But there are others too. But some anyway. of these in the chat. Yeah. So I, just like yeah, yeah, I can make a list. Are you familiar with Isaacs and Wallandowski? It's a little bit older. I'm not sure called, what's the name of it. That it's called Designing from Both Sides of the Screen. So it's Ellen no, Isaacs who's that a sounds UX great. For, Yeah. It's it's a wonderful book because it sounds like it's much like yours. I often hmm. recommend it because it's a UX person mm -hmm. and a computer scientist talking oh, to one another about how to work on the same project. Oh, I totally want that. I'll show you, hold on one sec, I'll be right back. And there's of course, Cliff Nass's book, which I'm of sure has been mentioned. So Cliff Nass was an awesome guy. And I, I worked with him a little bit. And then there's also this, which is, has been around for a while, but is still very relevant. A lot of the stuff. Ah, cool. We should make a list, obviously. And then there's this one. Which, which one is, is also. Who's that one? Oh, I'm really? trying to get it into the can you read Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, and of course, Kathy Pearl's book. Yes, Kathy Pearl. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I said her name wrong earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you meant. <laughs> yeah. Another yeah, nuance alum. <laughs> right. Um, right. Now, Kathy is interestingly not a um, linguist. Right. But I think she has she's come to appreciate linguists. <laughs> sure. And I mean, she, she's also um, she's an undergrad at UCSD uh, in CogSci. And right. then she's computer science. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And interestingly, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if she's written this up, but uh, mm. Abby, you know, um, Abby Jones, she's at in health at Google now. Mm. But for a little while, she was still, she was earlier at Google in a voice position and she mm -hmm. had to, she gave a presentation and so on, which was great. Uh, her background, I think, is English literature, and she was a, a Teach for America person before she found her way into UX, and so has some great perspectives then on ordinary language use, right? I actually, I did finally come up with another example too. I knew this oh, was good. Happen. good. Okay. <laughs> Quick before I forget now. Yeah. Um, one thing, this has actually come up a couple of times in, in different shapes. But working with customers, because this is the thing that we also try to really cover is working with customers or clients or end users, not end users per se, but you know the people who pay the bill and want a specific thing, it can be really tricky, right? Um, because, and that's why we also want to teach them as much as possible about how voice works, right? Because the more they understand, they're not going to ask for things that are as crazy, hopefully. Um, and... Um, there has been an example of 
people saying, well, we don't want to recognize that because we don't want to deal with it. This happened in a healthcare situation. And, you know, said, well, can we just like, don't basically say, don't let people say that, or if they do it, ignore them or something. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> and we have to explain that you can't, first of all, you can't make people do certain things, end users, right? They will say whatever is relevant, or, you know, you shouldn't stop them. You can't, right? Um, but you have a choice of what to do with it. And obviously, and we said, importantly, you also can't say, don't put this into the grammars or into the recognition, right? Because then it will match with something else. And so you have for to deal example, with that. Well, give me, give me a. Yeah. Friend. So let's say it's um, let's say it's the name of a, a drug, right? So this is a healthcare thing. Okay. So maybe it was a competitor's drug name. I mean, that wasn't the case, but it would be the same thing. And maybe this. Well, we don't want to recognize that because that's not our drug, right? I was like, well, have you looked at drug names? Right. <laughs> First of all, people can't pronounce them because they're really complicated. And even if so, then um, if you say something that sounds similar but it's not the same one, then it's gonna match with that, kind of like that kitchen pool example. Mm -hmm. So you have to deal with it. So put it in and then you can say, oh, we don't have any information about that thing or something, right? You have to actually, so it's like, it's an yeah, attractor. Pretend, yeah. pretend to be ignorant as yeah. a result. Or, yeah, it would be helpful, right? You can say, well, that's not something we work with or whatever the case is, but you have to have something that's the correct attractor so it doesn't match to something else and then runs off with it so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good so i would hope that uh can you put your the link to your book also in the sure. chat That'd yeah i'll do that and, and all those other books i yeah, yeah. marcus has been trying to uh, oh, cool. keep up with us a little oh bit. good great thank you, marcus. you know. <laughs> <laughs> good and uh let's we'll see if there's anything there okay paulina on. is your hand up for a new question or an old question okay, okay. <laughs> just want to check just want to check uh, anybody else have questions or comments for Anne? And I should say too that I love talking to people who are interested in getting into this space. I do that a lot. So by all means, you know, figure out how to, you know, Nancy can tell people how to get in touch with me or whatever. And um, um, or just ping me, find me on LinkedIn. I was know, say, with my last name, that's pretty easy. You're, you're, you're pretty easy to find, <laughs> yeah, exactly. in, right? Yeah. And just remember, it's Anne without an E. That's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can totally um, find me there and just send me a question or whatever. I'm cool. always happy to talk to people. I was going to say... Um, Yoseline, are you ready? Okay, she's got a question. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm ready. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm very interested in this type of work, but I don't know much about it. So I'm definitely getting your book. Uh, but my question is, um, out of the blue, I ended up, uh, I do some coaching in Spanish oh. for actors. And I ended up being called uh, for a, a different project. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being that it's for um, a speech recognition mm -hmm. uh, device. And I was just thinking the other day, can I add that to my resume as I worked for a voice interface, even though I was part, you know, training the actor to deliver in a certain sure. language. I mean, that that's part of what buoy designers do. If they work with um, voice talents, uh, that's something we've done a lot. I mean, and that's a whole actually interesting field um, or area to look mm -hmm. at. Do you use synthetic speech? where you just you know try and type something in and get it to come out the right way, or do you use with a voice actor and get them to say things a certain way and the pros and cons of those two, right? Um, but absolutely, that's something we do a lot, um, you know, and, and the buoy designers are very good people to do their actual coaching because they know exactly what they have in mind and where to stress things. And that is very much, you know, a great wedding of linguistics and, and voice technology. Um, and so, yeah. What kind of, if you can say, what kind of device was it that you were working on? Uh, I can't say. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, I can't. Figure. No. But, but it, it is like a home. Um, a home thing. Device. I guess okay. I just can't say the brand. But um, yeah, yeah. So a general yeah. audience that you're looking for, you know, general uh, and not a specific domain knowledge. Yes. Yeah. And 
so you because you mentioned there's the NLP department, which is a very technical coding side of it, and then the the designer and the speech science. Speech science so yeah. my my experience being more on the design side mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And you know when when I first started at Nuance for many of those years, we were very broad in that we there were projects where I basically did everything from start to finish because they were smaller and I mean like there was something for Norwegian. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I don't speak Norwegian, but I, you know, speak Swedish and therefore it's, you know, I can write the grammars for it. I'm like, and then I would that's a you know another question of how do you speaking a language in itself is not enough to do voice design for it right because you also need to know about the culture and, and things like that um, but there's always an overlap right and there's certain things you can still do you can like check on other people's work and things like that but um so depending on where you're at even especially at smaller companies that's probably why i like smaller companies too right that i like to do more not just one thing you know one slice of the pie but i kind of like to taste all of the pie you know as much as possible because i also think that that leads to better uh, implementations of better solutions because people kind of see what happens you know the in my experience the buoy designers that have had a chance to do some of the speech science and vice versa they make better stuff right because you, you understand more of the big picture so. would you recommend um coding experience on any of those absolutely or yes <laughs> no matter what you do yes <laughs> okay and that's not you know it's definitely not my my strong suit and if i came into the field now i it would be um i mean i've done coding right but i'm i'm very rusty i'm not that proficient in it because it's not something i do i have other people who do it so i never learn it right <laughs> but um but it's always a good thing of course you should know that absolutely and in general I mean, the people say, well, what language should I learn? Well, that's, that's kind of, I mean, in general, if you have to pick one, probably Python, but because it well, comes up a lot in language situations, but, uh, um, but always, yes, learn to, learn to code. It's always going to be good. If nothing else, you can use it. I mean, it's for things like uh, manipulating text files is very good, right? If you, because if you're doing anything that's kind of looking at data, being able to pull things out quickly, just like all things with this word or, you know, organize it in this way, that kind of thing is, is very, very useful. So um, I don't know, um, Chris, since you're on the line there, I, I don't know if you have any comments about that, but uh, if you're paying attention, I'll jump in. I am here. Yeah. <laughs> Do you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, 100%. Okay, can, good, good answer. Buy without, you know, in language technology and, NLP in that sort of world without coding, and, but it will never hurt. Yeah, It will only help That's you. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, I've had a lot of questions about like, well, I tried to do this intro to Python class and got bored um, because, you know, it just asked me to manipulate strings and stuff like that. But if that's the case, get a project, exactly. you know, find a project that you yes. want to do. Like um, if you're unhappy with how, uh, you know, um, some ASR technology is not able to recognize your accent and speech, you know, dig into it, like figure out what, what is the deal? Can you make a contribution to the project? Um, you know, do, do yeah. you know, yeah, that's hard, but so is the work. I mean, the work is very hard, you know. And even if it doesn't work out in any way, it's also a great thing that if you're looking for a job and you talk about what you've done, people would eat that up. Man. It's like, oh, you actually did that. You actually tried to. Yeah. fix something in recognition for this context that's awesome come work for us <laughs> i may simplify it a little bit but you know it's absolutely it would be a great plus yeah thank you both. sure <laughs> and thanks we need more thanks, linguists Chris in the field absolutely yes and there's plenty of room for linguists. Thank yes, you, yes. Stuart, who's currently at Google to be able to talk to us about this. And I know your background is phonetics and that you've done a lot of things that require some amount of coding in recent years. Right, so I've, I've gotten away with taking- oh, He's very flexible in the industry. Now yeah. job title, computational linguist. And I didn't study computational linguistics. <laughs> This is how industry works. Yeah, titles don't really mean a lot in this field right now. It's one thing. If you're looking for jobs too, if you're looking for 
particular job. You just have to read, try to read between lines or read what they're looking for, but don't just say, oh, that title is not me. You don't know. Right. Worth reading the description, mm -hmm. worth throwing your hat in the ring, and then getting to talk to somebody more about what the scope of the job actually exactly. is. So don't let the job description turn you off if there's even like a quarter of absolutely that's worth that's attractive to you and really push the linguistics thing i mean really i'm gonna say this is one if you don't know what linguistics is you know you talk to them like here's why linguists are great for this we look at language from a sort of object you know we can distance ourselves and that's something that a lot of people can't do right you say oh well i speak blah 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 i speak english so i can make a skill for alexa whatever like yeah there's more to it than that right um and but that's kind of the attitude they always get like, well it's just language i speak it so how can this be and um and that's the hardest part of working with customers really because everybody gets so kind of into their way of thinking and that's where you come in and say well here as a linguist we learn to study language more objectively from a distance whatever analyzing it and this is how it plays into this job and i think we should all be seriously you know heavily banging our drums if we're going as linguists into any kind of technical job and say this is why you need me <laughs> i say to you because i don't talk like that myself but <laughs> but it's still true <laughs> great well i'm going to say uh everybody you notice that marcus added the evaluation form so that means we're getting to the end of our time and if there are any last questions for Anne at the moment that you've thought of, I'd be happy to entertain them. Otherwise, please seek her out and Oops. can learn more, mm -hmm. right? Yes, join us. Join us in the field. Yeah. <laughs> we need strong linguists in yes, all those places. Totally. Cool. And we got some little uh, party and clapping symbols. And I thank you, Anne, for sharing your morning with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Good. My and pleasure. I think it's awesome that you're doing this. Thank you. I do too. <laughs> so everybody uh, go forth and be wonderful. Mm -hmm.